that's my planning process. And it sounds a little more complicated than it actually is. She is human. I kind of feel like maybe you're a robot. I I cannot. (laughs) See, like, I feel like you're just on another level. Hi, I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is The Pursuit, where I help you in your journey, your hustle, and your climb to be your best self and put out your best work. After all, I'm still hustling for that too, guys. So I sit down and interview today's most successful celebrities, executives, and entrepreneurs, and I break down success for the rest of us. This is a Pursuit Profile episode with Natalie McNeil. Natalie McNeil is the media entrepreneur behind SheTakesOnTheWorld.com, which Forbes called one of the top 10 websites for entrepreneurial women. She is also an Emmy award-winning producer and the best-selling author of She Takes on the World, The Conquer Kit, and most recently, Conquer Your Year. After building multiple businesses and the She Takes on the World brand, she is now focused on transforming businesses around the world through The Conquer Club, a 12-month implementation incubator program for entrepreneurs. She has appeared in outlets like Inc., Forbes, Forbes Woman, Wall Street Journal, CNN, Mashable, and more. I sat down with her recently to talk about how she built her blog into a thriving business. I'm so excited to talk to you today because you have such an interesting entrepreneurial journey that I think a lot of people can relate to and I love how actionable and detailed your tips are sometimes. So I think you guys are going to get a ton of value out of this interview. I always like to go back to the beginning and for you, I think a great story that kind of sums up your entrepreneurial hustle is the lemonade stand as a kid. Can you explain how you did that? (laughs) Yeah, I was always the kid with the lemonade stand. So seven-year-old Natalie was already a very uh, hustling, (laughs) hustle-oriented entrepreneur. And I had my mother basically as my first employee. (laughs) She was very supportive. And once I had success with the lemonade stand, I reinvested that money into selling other things like popsicles and freezies and I got my dad to help me make a cooler out of a wagon. So already those entrepreneurial juices were flowing and that entrepreneurial spirit was blossoming even from a young age. And then going through the school system, there were definitely people who tried to steer me away from that. Mm -hmm. And eventually in university I found my way back to that and decided to create my own job. And I do believe that the best way to create your dream job is is really to do it yourself. You know, that's the best way to land that job that you dream of having. And that's what I've done and what I'll continue to do. What I love about the uh, lemonade stand though is the wagon. You went to people's houses because you realized (laughs) you could get more money by going to their houses than standing on the corner, which is such a great illustration. (laughs) Then you're counting, okay, how many people am I going to get over the next hour? And then you think if I walk around the neighborhood, I can hit up like 30 houses (laughs) in an hour if I'm fast and if I stay on point and focus on the sale instead of talking to people. I love it. So you go to school and immediately enter entrepreneurship. How did you, I mean, you must have, like you said, people say, saying, don't do it, say, get, you know, get some real world experience first. So how did you have the courage to just go and do it right on your own, right off the bat? The thing that I needed to personally do is give myself the time and space to hear my own inner voice. So before I graduated from university, I decided to take a solo trip to Europe. Went all by myself. Wow. My mom didn't like that very much. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> but I went alone because I just needed space. And sometimes we need that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we know what's right for us. But as Steve Jobs always said, we let the noise of other people's opinions drown out what we know mm-hmm. is our truth and what feels right for us. So I was driving through the Czech Republic and I was listening to David Guetta, mm-hmm. his song, The World Is Mine. <laughs> and I drove past in that moment a giant globe that was like two stories high that said the world is yours mm-hmm. and I still have a picture of it it's in my first book she takes on the world and it was in that moment that I felt that truth so deeply and so strongly and I was able to say I know what I want and what I want has to outweigh what everybody else wants me to do and I went home and I started that first business and I decided to create my own dream job. 
Awesome. Now the first business, that's when you won an Emmy, right? That was one of the first businesses, yeah. So talk about the first couple businesses, because now we all know you as She Takes on the World Inc. and Conquer Club and amazing things, but there's a few businesses right before that. So walk us through some of that. Yes. So when I was a teenager, I had a couple businesses. I sold stationery (laughs) and I sold gift baskets to people. So those were smaller, Mm -hmm. I'd say dabbling (laughs) type businesses where I still learned a lot about entrepreneurship and about how to run a business and how to manage money and cash flow. So very good foundational experiences for me. Out of university, I had another media and marketing related business that did not go well (laughs) at all. I had business partners on that, which was really the biggest mistake in all of that is in the earlier days, I didn't have enough confidence in my own abilities and felt like I always needed to do things with another person, Mm. with someone else. And that was where I found my confidence being able to say, okay, well, you know, we're in this together. It wasn't all on me. And that doesn't always work out well. Partnerships are, they're like marriages. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you are fully aligned with those people and that you all share a common vision. And that is really, really hard to get everyone on the same page. So shortly after all of that, uh, Imaginarius was the production and media company that I ran with my partner, Vincent Marconi, and we won this Emmy for producing the world's first 360 degree interactive documentary Wow! How with cool. the National Film Board. Really cool project. We were so proud of it. And the Emmy was just the, the icing yeah. <laughs> on the cake because we did put a lot of hard work into that project. So things at that point were rolling and I worked with Vincent for many years, but at the same time, She Takes on the World was taking off in a big way. And we were starting to get so much media attention that eventually it became time to make that choice and Vincent is an artist and wanted to be focused on his artwork too. So we both had these other passion projects Hmm. that meant so much to us. And eventually we decided to focus on those instead. And that's what led me to in 2011, make the decision to do She Takes on the World full time and just honor all of that momentum. Mm -hmm. So how did you, I mean, you have this full time business which is even more than having a full-time job because you have, you're running a business and you're blogging on the side. So how did you grow all that momentum for your side hustle, which is really what it was at the time? Yes. Whenever someone has a side hustle, my recommendation is that you always create a really solid five to nine plan. So you've got your nine to five. What can you get done in that day? In my case, it was still my own business. So I had to work so hard to make sure that I could wrap up my day job Mm -hmm. by five o'clock. And then I had this plan in place between, usually it was five and nine, sometimes it was six and 10, doesn't matter. There were a few solid hours every day that I would focus on just doing two or three things to Mm -hmm. move forward. And in those earlier days of She Takes on the World, sometimes that was creating a smaller digital course, sometimes it was writing for the blog, or sometimes it was writing for another media outlet. Sometimes it was filming a video, but just small baby steps. The thing is, I consistently did it every day. Mm. There wasn't a week that went by where I said, oh, I'm just not going to work on She Takes on the World this week. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to let it sit on the back burner. It meant a lot to me. And I was honoring that momentum by staying consistent and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see a lot of people start to lose momentum and end up really stuck. Mm. And if you want to turn that side hustle into a full-time gig, yeah, you've got to work on it consistently. How long did that take? We did, so I started She Takes on the World in 2008. Mm-hmm. I didn't turn it into a full-time business and incorporate it until the end of 2011. Okay. So I had already been doing it for a few years when I decided there's a lot here. I'm feeling it in my bones that this is what I need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And that was starting in 2011. So even that's been quite a few years that I've had it as my full time. Yeah. Work. Why did you decide to do around the funding? I think a lot of people are like, you know, just build your blog and monetize. And so that's like a very different step than most bloggers take. Why'd you do that? 
I would say She Takes on the World was not a blog at that point. And even now, this is one of the things that a lot of people find it difficult to wrap their heads around, especially family and friends and people who don't understand the online world. <laughs> They're like, how can you make so much money right. from a blog? And it's like, it's not a blog. Right. <laughs> That's why I treat it as a business. And I think for people who want to turn their blogs into something so much bigger, you have to look at it as a business. I treated that blog as a company, as a corporation, mm -hmm. not as just a website that I went to write a post on. So that right. was a really big difference. And I also had this vision for the Conquer Club. And the Conquer Club is really the heart of what She Takes on the World Inc. is now. Mm. So that's our 12 month business incubator. And we have a whole team of mentors that we provide you access to for an entire year. That was the vision that I had. And that was the reason why I went and raised that round of funding in 2011. To build the, the club. To build portion. out the Conquer Club into, it, it wasn't the full vision. It's still not the full vision. When you're an entrepreneur, yeah, it's never the full vision. <laughs> you're always slowly working toward mm -hmm. what you have in your head. But that was step one. That round of funding allowed us to build out step one. Gotcha. And I actually bought out those investors last year. So all of that has since been paid back and closed. And... Now it's it's all me again. So lots of Congrats. good lessons learned in yeah. doing that. I'm glad I did it because I think as entrepreneurs, all of those experiences just make you a better entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And it definitely made me a better entrepreneur to raise that round of funding. I don't know if I would do it again at mm. this point and moving forward, but it was a great learning experience. So I know you've mentioned a lot of times that one of the tipping points for you was the Forbes article. They, they featured you, right? Yeah. So maybe talk about how you got that and then some other tipping points along the way. Most of my major media, including Forbes, was through Twitter. Hmm. So I was an early adopter of Twitter when it was mostly focused on business. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a thriving business community on that platform that I got very involved in. And... That's actually how Forbes found me and reached out. They were starting to work on Forbes Woman as a new platform mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And they were reaching out to women who were blogging about business. And that was all, all happened on Twitter. A lot of my major media has happened on Twitter, following reporters, connecting with journalists and editors, and making a point to engage in those larger conversations. And that is an investment of your time, but one that can definitely pay off. Business is all about building strong relationships. Mm -hmm. And Twitter was the platform that I used to build relationships with people who I otherwise may not have had access to. Gotcha. And so then moving forward, how maybe talk for people who want to get a book deal, because you got a multi-book deal, right, with Penguin. Yes, for I have a Conquer second Kit book coming out yeah, it's coming with out. them. So, and I want to talk about what's in Conquer Kit because I think yeah. it's fascinating. But any advice for people who want to get a book deal? Getting a book deal is often about the platform that you've built mm -hmm. and the media exposure that you've been able to get. A publisher wants to make sure that the book is going to have success. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that if they are paying you for an advance or they're putting all this time and money into producing your book that it's going to be able to sell. So it really becomes a numbers game. They want to make sure that you have enough people following you that if they do the math and figure out what a uh, conversion rate would be on the number of people who would actually buy the book, they just want to make sure that the math works out. Mm. They want to make sure that you have reached through the media as well. And so the best piece of advice I could give anyone who wants to write a book is like focus on building your platform. That's the best thing that you can do. Have a great uh, opt-in offer, focus on being featured in the media so that you can show them that your reach is you know, tens of thousands of people at least so that they know you've got what it takes. And of course you can always self-publish as well. 
And that can also help you build your list and build that exposure and that preeminence that you need in order to approach the bigger publishers. You know, it took me quite a few years of building She Takes on the World before I got a deal with my dream publisher. Yeah. And it, it's about the consistency, right? If I had said two years ago, oh, I've been doing this for five years, it's so exhausting to produce a really value packed piece of content every week. We now give worksheets and downloadables with all of our she takes on the world.com content. And it's a lot yeah. of time. You know this. It's a huge investment of time and resources. And so many people give up along the way. And if you want those bigger opportunities, you've got to be in this for the long haul. So mm. find something that you are going to be passionate about talking about yeah. on a regular basis because you've You've got to do it. You've got to do it consistently. While we're on the book, uh, before we started rolling, you talked about your book tour up at 3 a.m., going all the way until 11 p.m., you know, doing the uh, morning radio, morning TV, then doing interviews, you know, podcasts, and then speaking, and then meet and greets. I mean, I'm tired just thinking about it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I know you have some content coming out shortly about this, but why don't you just talk about some of your health habits that keeps you energized for something like that? Absolutely. There are a lot of biohacks that I do. I'm a big believer that health is wealth. You've got to take care of you before you take care of anyone else and take care of you so that you have the energy to do the work that you want to do in the world and that the world needs. So a few things that I do health wise. Every morning I start my day with green juice and bulletproof coffee. So bulletproof coffee is the, it, it's almost like a coconut oil but at a really high uh, higher concentration and it's called mm. brain octane the oil that i use from bulletproof so that's how i kick off my day always a bit of exercise in the morning always some sort of uh, rhythmic breathing i've studied meditation for a very long time i teach meditation now it's a core part of my life so those are the things i do to start my day throughout the day instead of reaching for that cup of coffee, I usually have uh, mid afternoon, or if I feel like I'm starting to crash, I'll have a spoonful of bee pollen and coconut oil. It's a good energy really? boost instead of having to reach for that caffeine and that, mm. that coffee. Getting enough exercise, staying hydrated, actually in the new book, Conquer Your Year, it breaks the conquer kit down into a day-to-day -day plan so it's almost like an entrepreneurial planner journal and every day there's a spot for you to fill in your water consumption so every day we're asking you to uh, yeah. pencil in or, or color in the water glasses and there's eight every day staying hydrated is huge mm. huge 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 I can't emphasize that enough and then it's just what you put into your body as well fresh organic uh, produce and I'm always having a lot of greens with every meal. I do mostly vegetarian diet and just eating to fuel you. Mm. You know, it's easy when you're a busy entrepreneur on the go to just grab something quick. And if you can learn how to prep that ahead of time, it will just do wonders for your health. So I do a lot of meal prep on Sundays so that mm. I know I'm going to have the fuel that I need for the week ahead. So those are some of my top awesome. tips. Now, um, talking about that's batching, Sunday night you're doing all of your meals. <laughs> I know you're a big believer in batching of your content Batching's as well. Batching's my life. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well then tell, teach batching, us your ways batching about is batching, my life. please. Okay. <laughs> so I was actually speaking with Kelsey before the interview about my filming schedule for She Takes on the World TV. So we filmed 12 months of content in less than a week. And it's all about preparing, getting things done so that you don't have to worry about them for a long period of time. So if I had to film She Takes on the World TV every single week, it's a huge investment just to get all the equipment set up. I have an amazing crew that I work with to get them in, to get our set ready to go, mm -hmm. um, hair, makeup, styling, all of it. It's so much work, as you know. So it's so much easier if we can get a whole bunch of content done in a short period of time and then get it scheduled and ready to go. If we can batch that content, 
we have more time for the bigger picture and for the strategies that we want to execute. So that is a huge part of my life, even with the meal prep, prepping things in advance so that at five o'clock when I'm getting that burst of energy to just keep working, I don't have to say, okay, now I'm gonna have to go and chop all these veggies and make myself something to eat because mm -hmm. it's already prepared and it's easier. It saves you so much time to chop all your veggies on Sunday and put them all into bags or compartments or even freeze them and just do that all at once mm -hmm. for like five or six meals, then it takes you to every single day be prepping for a new meal. So batching just saves you so much time. And as an entrepreneur, you always have to be finding ways to save yourself time because that's how you get to work on the bigger picture. Yeah. And too many entrepreneurs are in their business all the time and they're working on just that next thing that they need to do or those next couple things instead of being able to work on their business mm -hmm. and working on your business that's where the growth happens that's where the magic is that's how you're going to be able to hit those revenue goals and goals for reach and engagement you need time to work on your business and batching helps you do that. <laughs> yeah. But you, it was what? 72 hours in four we days? did 72 videos, videos in four days. Can you guys believe that? Which took four weeks of prep. You told Which me. Which took about to four weeks of prep. Yeah. But the great thing about that is now we're able to queue up content for a year so that we can focus on the things that are going to grow our business in really big ways. And it's been great to be able to have my team working on bigger picture content strategy and getting that content out into the world in a bigger way instead of always scrambling to be creating content. You right. know, I don't want to have to, I know a lot of people do this. Um, I know some of you out there do this <laughs> where you think, okay, I haven't written a blog post in a couple weeks or haven't put a video out in a couple weeks. I need to create something. So you're like, okay, I'm going to get it out on Wednesday. And then on Tuesday night, you're sitting at the computer and you're looking at the screen and you're like, what do I want to say? I don't know what I want to say. And then you try to create something because you think you have to create something, but it's so hard to have that pressure. Hmm. And then you might sit in front of the camera if you do, if you want to do video content or you, you sit there trying to write that polished piece of, of written content. And it's just... It just takes so much time. Hmm. You do waste you ever, so much time. Do you ever like, I mean, you're six months in. Do you ever think, oh, I want to tweak that? Oh, of course. But you, but it's done. All I mean, the time. it's already, and you just it's don't let done. yourself. And well, one of the things you need to learn, I think, as an entrepreneur sometimes is to just let go of the perfection. Hmm. I grew up being such a perfectionist. I mean, I was that kid who got upset if she got you know, one word wrong on the spelling test mm. or didn't get a perfect math test back. Um, I wanted everything to be perfect. And I've learned that you can't do that as an entrepreneur and grow your business. So my goal is to always get things to where I'm like 80% happy. And then we get it out there and we get feedback and we tweak it along the way. And the great thing about the video content, even though, yes, the content that's going to come out eight months later, I might be like, oh, like my hair looks a little different now, or <laughs> yeah. oh, I would have said it a little bit differently, but it's done. And the great thing about having all of it done this year is that I've got to do more Facebook live mm. uh, events. I've mm -hmm. got to do more webinars and trainings where I'm connecting directly with my audience. And I created space for that by batching yeah. and that's made a big difference. So at least I know that I can also speak about where I'm at right now as well. So you mentioned that the batching helps you focus on the big goals that really actually grow your business. Mm -hmm. So maybe give us some examples of what yours are and, and your five by five that's in the Conquer Kit. My five by five. Yeah. So one of the big five by fives for this year was to do this new book, Conquer Your Year, to break the Conquer Kit down into a day-to-day -day action plan for 52 weeks. Finding time and space to write a book is <laughs> definitely yeah. a bigger picture goal, especially when you're already busy. So that was a big five by five. Moving to the United States was on my five by five for this year and for anyone who's like, what's this five by five thing? The five by five is your bigger picture plan. It's from my book, The Conquer Kit. And it's basically your five bigger picture goals. So these are the things that are going to challenge you to achieve, 
to achieve these goals. You are going to be pushed to your limits. And I set no more than five of those in a year. And then for every bigger picture goal, I break that down into at least five milestones that keep me on track. So the five by five is your five bigger picture goals times the five milestones. So these are 25 main things that you're working on for the year, which I find makes your year flow a lot better. And I feel like it's easier when you know that you're focusing on 25 things in 365 days, because then you know what to say yes to and what to say no to. You are always gonna have a million different things that you could potentially be doing. And if you have this five by five plan, if you have those 25 things, you can say, this speaking engagement doesn't align with these 25 things, mm. or I just don't have time to do that post that this blogger asked me for because it's not gonna fit into this bigger vision mm -hmm. and I need to make sure I'm hitting those milestones. So one of the big things for me was also moving this year and I'm just getting through that now. It has been a very exhausting process that's actually taken up way more energy <laughs> than I thought yeah. it would. So that's been more like two bigger picture <laughs> goals right. for me this year because we're also moving companies across borders and it's, yeah. it's a challenge to move. Even though Canada and the US are very close, and I can still fly home easily and all that, but it's still, it's still moving to a new country. So there's still a lot of work that is involved. Another way to allow yourself to focus on the big picture is to hire help. So why don't you just talk a little bit, because now you said your team is what, 18 or so people? Yeah, not full time, but yeah. Okay, yeah. but I'm sure you have some insights on starting to build a team and growing a team. Absolutely. The first thing that I did that I recommend anyone do, especially in the beginning stages, is look at your budget and just see what you can afford. Mm -hmm. So when I was starting out, I could afford a virtual assistant for only a couple hours a week. And I made the decision to hire that person. And I got her to do the publishing of my blog posts, mm -hmm. which I was still spending a lot of time on, just formatting all the yeah. headlines and secondary headlines yeah. and getting the post published. I didn't need to be doing that. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first tasks that I outsourced. And I committed to in those couple hours I was saving myself to go out and grow revenue, to mm -hmm. pitch new clients, to bring more money through the door. So you need to try and get things off your plate those things that are making you work in your business yeah. so that you can free up time to work on your business. Just make sure, make sure that when you hire that person, you're not going and spending those extra couple hours you've saved on Facebook. Right, or, <laughs> right, yeah. Checking your social media profiles. Yeah. You've got to make sure that you spend that time doing the right things. But that would be my advice to you is just start where you can. And one of the things that I also did was started hiring someone to clean my house. That was mm. a job that I didn't have to be doing. And with that extra time, I was able to focus on building the business. And even mm. now you have platforms like TaskRabbit that make it so easy for you to outsource some of your chores. So you don't mm. just have to outsource your, your business stuff, but life sourcing yeah. can be a really, really powerful way for you to free up time to work on your business. Well, why don't you just before a couple more questions there's so much i could ask you but <laughs> give us an example of what the five because you're so good at breaking things down and if you guys go look just search her name on itunes and listen to some of her podcast interviews where she explains how to break things down into actionable parts because we all have these big dreams and goals and then we can't figure out how to actually do them so what are the five milestones for the big writing your book what are those five milestones for your book Okay, good question. I'm going to I'm going to break this down for someone who might be wanting their first book deal because the process for me at this point is very different considering I already have this publisher. So this next book that I did for this year is is different. Mm -hmm. So let's make it more applicable to a lot of people out there. So let's say that you have this goal to write your first book. Awesome. Let's say you want to get a publisher for it. You don't want to self-publish. Your milestones to break that down might start 12 to 18 months, maybe even 24 months before. I actually, you might be surprised to hear this, the time it took me to pitch the Conquer kit to my dream agents, land that agent, and then by the time the agent felt that the proposal we co-wrote together was ready for going to a traditional publishing house, one of the big publishing houses, was two years. 
Wow. Two years from the day that I said, I'm doing this book and I wrote the first proposal and I had my list of agents. I managed to get that agent, but even that took several months. And then her and I worked on the proposal for several months. It was two years later, almost to the day that I actually got that book deal. Wow. So these goals sometimes span multiple years. Mm. And this is what I want you to hear. You know, nothing happens overnight. Yeah. It is true that an overnight success is sometimes 10 years in the making. So let's say you want to get your first book deal. In a one year period, this is how I would break it down. First of all, you need to have a, an editorial calendar ready to go. You need to be producing consistent content, not just on your own site, and maybe you don't produce weekly for your own site, depending on the reach that you have. If you already have tens of thousands of people following you, great. If not, every week you probably wanna alternate between doing a Quora post, doing a Medium post, posting for other blogs and media outlets that have a bigger reach, but you want to be consistently appearing in other sites and consistently producing content on your own site. So you would create that editorial calendar for the next 12 months and follow it to a T and okay. stay consistent. You would also need to write your proposal mm -hmm. and that can be a huge undertaking in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the proposal is harder than actually writing the book. Yeah because you're figuring out all the pieces of the book and the features. So you've got to work on writing that proposal, carving out time to do that. You have to put together your list of agents and you need to pitch that proposal first to the agents. Hmm. After you land the agent, you need more time carved out for enhancing the proposal, mm -hmm. editing it, getting yeah. it ready for the publishers. At the same time, you need to carve out time for pitching the media and making sure that you have endorsements lined up and features already lined up, that's gonna make a big difference. So that's going to be another huge part of that goal to land the book deal. And then you actually go out and you pitch to these publishers and there's a lot of prep involved in that. So that would be a whole milestone in and of itself, wow. making sure that you're prepared for the questions that you can talk about different features and what you're willing to change and the vision that you have for this book and how it's going to get out into the world. So those would be some of the top level milestones. And then of course those get broken down even further. Hmm. So if you took something like writing the proposal, what I personally do is say, okay, the proposal is 12 different sections. Each of those 12 sections is going to go into Asana as a separate due date and task. Um, and I'm going to methodically work through writing that proposal, checking everything off along the way mm. so that I know that I'm actually getting it done. So after you have those bigger picture milestones, it is your responsibility to make sure that those go into a project management system so that you can hold yourself accountable. And that's my planning process. And it sounds a little more complicated than it actually is. She is human. Yeah. I kind of feel like maybe <laughs> you're a robot. I, I cannot no. <laughs> see. Like I feel like you're just on another level, which okay. is the level we need to get to if we want to achieve the kind of ex amazing success that you had. But I think that is such a great lesson because I mean, people would maybe put like find agent, you know, make proposal, and then like. Pitch guest posts. Yeah, and, and that here's what happens, Kelsey. <laughs> this is what I, why I love talking to people about this at my keynotes and events too, because sometimes people just don't realize how much detail has to go into your planning. Mm. And if you just put a task into Asana that said uh, pitch agents, it's so easy for you to put that off because there aren't any deliverables on that. And that's the biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs make is not having enough deliverables, not having enough things to hold yourself accountable. So if you know that, okay, on this day, I'm pitching this agent, this day I'm pitching this agent, mm -hmm. and it's all broken down, if you miss that deadline, it's easy for you to reschedule that and to get back on track. If you miss the deadline for pitch agents, you don't know where to dive into that. Right. You don't know where to start. Then yeah. you start feeling bad about yourself because you didn't get it done and you miss that task, and then if you miss that task, you're definitely not gonna get the book deal because then it snowballs yeah, it into snowball. you mm -hmm. missing other tasks. And then all of a sudden it's the end of the year and you say, well, I didn't reach that goal, that really sucks. 
Yeah. And I feel like crap because I didn't reach that goal when really all you had to do was break it down. Right. <laughs> and this is why I have the conquer kit. This is why I did yeah. conquer your year because now I want it broken down for people day to day so that you can open that book and be like, I know what I'm doing today. I'm going to get this done. And it's a book I've wanted to create for a really long time. I'm excited about it. It sounds awesome. So I'm send you a copy. Oh, please do. Um, now, looking back on your entrepreneurial journey so far, so much has, you know, you've accomplished a lot and had so many changes. What's been the best part and the worst part so far? Best part and worst part. I think the best part is when you feel in alignment. Like it's not just one best moment. Some people are like, well, the Emmy must have been the best moment of your oh. career. <laughs> yes, those are great moments, but when you feel the best, it's when you feel like you are in the right place, doing the right thing, totally aligned. And that's what this move was about for me. Mm. It was so uncomfortable to take that leap. It was so uncomfortable to leave friends and family in the, the country that I love so much and to move to a brand new place without that support network around me. Yeah. But this is where I needed to be for that full feeling of alignment. And even though it's uncomfortable, it's one of the best feelings because I know that I'm where I'm meant to be right mm. now. Yeah. That is always the best and always the highlight for me. Or when we produce something and people sometimes it's the things that you don't expect to go viral or the things yeah. that you don't really expect people to resonate with so deeply but when you do that and people are like oh my god this just changed my day or this made such a big impact on me those are the times when it's like the best feeling ever to be an mm -hmm. entrepreneur the worst feeling there have been a few i would say that this has actually evolved for me the worst feeling used to be when I got a nasty comment mm -hmm. or criticism because you're going to get that online all the time. Mm -hmm. And I did this women's empowerment speech a few years back that I just had so many nasty comments on it on mm -hmm. YouTube from people who just hide cowardly behind their online persona. Right. They're not real names or anything, but... I let that affect me so deeply and I will never do that again. Mm. I think you need to learn how to protect yourself in this bubble and know that, and again, it goes back to the best feeling, when you know that you're in alignment with what you're doing, you can drown out everything mm -hmm. else. But that was one of the worst things for me when I was starting. Now I would say the worst thing is when I let myself get so busy that I start to forget, I start to forget the best part. Mm -hmm. You start to forget about the alignment. Sometimes you're just in hustle mode yeah. and you wake up one day and you're like, where did the last two weeks go? Like, I don't even, I've been hustling so much the last two weeks. I don't even know what I, what have I done for myself? Yeah. You know, and why am and I doing this? Exactly. And, and you question that. And that's the worst for me now, which is why I do try to stay very healthy. I, I stay very grounded as much as I can. So later today, this has been a big week and there's been so much going on moving because I'm brand new here. And yeah. you're like the, you're actually the first person who has stepped into my new home. Feels special. <laughs> Thank you for you're having the, us. You're the first person that's been here. So thanks for being my first guest yeah, here. Yeah, That is very special. I'll remember that forever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've been going through so much that later today I'll go down to the ocean for mm. sunset because the ocean is so close now that I'm in Los Angeles. And I'll go down and I'll have a sunset meditation and I'll, I'll go back to that why and to mm. that purpose and to that alignment. And I would say that those are the, the best and worst. I don't have moments where, like, yes, there are moments, of course, where it's like, this was a really crappy part mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur. I had a, a time last year when our payment processor, our merchant, held all of our funds that we were getting from our launch. Um, on that side, there was still some revenue coming in, but there was this massive hold. It was a very painful time to try to figure out how to deliver on everything that we promised our customers without actually receiving that revenue. And we wow. actually didn't get it for several months. That was awful yeah. to go through. Um, so that was definitely one of the worst 
I guess, experiences or situations, but I also learned a lot from mm-hmm. it. Looking back, it made me a way better entrepreneur to have to figure all of that out. Mm-hmm. But on a regular ongoing basis that that's my best and my worst is just best staying in alignment worst as soon as you're out of that alignment you should not be operating your business from that place that's when you've got to slow down and and tune back into yourself Mm, such great advice and so um your number one piece of advice for the entrepreneurs watching you know um want to become an author and a speaker and build an online platform what's your best piece of advice for them it has to be the consistency. Mm. It's, I would say it's, it's twofold. Like know your, know your purpose, stay in alignment with that, stay grounded in that. Remember that why always remember who you're serving. And then the other part of that is to consistently serve Mm. and you should be able to do that. You should have the energy to do that if you are in alignment because it just flows. If you have to sit in front of your computer screen and you're like, I don't know what the hell to write about right now. Yeah, yeah. That is when you may not be doing that thing that you should be doing. Of course, there are times when it's just not flowing. We all get writer's block right. sometimes. We all, if we film, there's, there are times when we look into the camera and we're like, <laughs> I don't know what I want to say right now. But if you've got the, the alignment and then you consistently create from that place of service and serving those people who are going to read your post or hear that speech you're working on or see this video that is that is the best advice that i can give you and now with conquer club you help so many entrepreneurs and you're a coach to them and you provide them with coaches have you had coaches and mentors throughout your career so far so many so many um too many to even name all of them i think you need to surround yourself with people who are going to lift you up. You need to surround yourself with people who have been where you want to go. And I've always looked for those people who are just a few steps ahead of me. Mm. Sometimes when somebody is like 50 steps ahead of you, it can be, it's not always the best relationship just because that person doesn't remember what it's like to be in Mm. your shoes. So I had this amazing mentor who, Um, I was very fortunate to get to sit down with a few times and she was at a point where her business was doing like a hundred million plus revenue Mm. and raising massive rounds of funding. And I think it was just hard for her to remember what it was like to be in my shoes. And I think it's best to find people who are just a few steps ahead of you Mm. and surround yourself with a great mastermind group or you know, join an incubator, go and work at a co-working space where there's going to be that powerful network because you've got to, you've got to be in that environment where you're motivated and where you're inspired. And I will say one more thing about mentorship. Mentors are not necessarily people who are going to jump on the phone with you every week or Mm -hmm. go for lunch with you every Friday. And sometimes I speak with entrepreneurs who have this idea that that's what mentorship is. Mm. And it's, it's not, I've had mentors who have come into my life for very short windows of time. Hmm. I've called up celebrity entrepreneurs randomly and got through to their assistant and been like, Hey, I would like to have five minutes of this person's time. Wow. <laughs> and sometimes it works out and yeah. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. But the worst thing someone can say is, is no, and that's not going to kill you. I think rejection is good for you sometimes. Yeah. So mentorship is not always what you think it is, but you absolutely need it to get to that next level. Man, there is so much we can learn from that interview, but here are my keys to success from Natalie McNeil. First, quiet your mind. Her entire journey started because she went solo to Europe to figure out, did she really want to be an entrepreneur right out of college? The answer was yes, and going on that trip gave her the idea for the brand and the name of the business. So she says listening to your intuition and getting quiet is key. Number two, make the time. I love that she says if you want to turn a side hustle into a big business, you have to work your five to nine. In other words, before and after your full-time job. She said she worked every day for a few hours taking small steps. Number three, maximize that time. Like she said, batching is her life. She batches her meals, she batches her work, 
doing 72 videos in four days, you guys, that is crazy. And that is what it takes to make the most of your time and free up your mind so you can do things like live streams and social media and stuff that's live and in the moment because you've already taken care of all of your scheduled content. Number four, make the commitment. She said that she put a huge investment of time and resources into creating content that eventually built her blog, got her her book deal, and started her whole online membership platform. You have to be consistent and put in the time. Number five, choose your priorities. I love her five by five plan. That's five major goals a year and five important high return on investment tasks per goal. That way you know what to say yes to and what to say no to. So make sure you figure out what those five big goals are according to your big vision each year. Number six, get really, really detailed. I hope you saw in the interview that you can't put a broad goal like get a book deal on your list and expect it to happen by the end of the year. You have to break things down into tiny steps so you can tackle them one by one. Number seven, be proactive. That Forbes feature that she received was a huge turning point for her brand. And that's because she reached out to journalists and writers and editors on Twitter, making relationships and joining the conversation. Don't wait for opportunities to come to you if you can create some of those opportunities yourself. Number eight, take care of yourself. Guys, this keeps happening in all of my interviews. These people really value their health. They do green juices and bulletproof coffee and they stay hydrated and they eat organic. She says that you have to take care of you so that you can give the world your best work. Number nine, find support. I love that she talked about co-working communities or mastermind groups or anything to keep yourself inspired. And she also talked about finding a mentor that's only a few steps ahead of you instead of light years ahead of you. A lot of us want these celebrity mentors, but sometimes they're so far advanced, they can't remember what it's like to be in the trenches. So find someone who's done what you want to do a few steps down the road. And also, outsource as soon as you can. Look at your budget and find support as soon as you can afford to hire some. Lastly, number 10, create a clear vision. Early on when she thought of her brand back on her trip in Europe, she envisioned way more than a blog. She knew what she wanted to create and so that helped her to create her priorities, to make her five by five plans. You have to create a clear vision from the start and as she said, remember why you're doing it and remember who you're serving. Such great advice. Thank you so much for letting us invade your new home. It's Thank lovely. Thank you. So, I'm so happy you were my first guest. Yeah, this has been awesome. <laughs> so where can people find out more about you? Yeah, you can come on over to shetakesontheworld.com. We've got so much for you there. Free course, retraining. You'll see the Conquer Club over there, or you can come to theconquerclub.com as well. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Again, so many actionable tips. I know you guys loved this episode. So thank you again for watching. I'm Kelsey Humphreys here with Natalie McNeil, and this has been The Pursuit. Don't forget, guys, there are three ways to support the show. You can subscribe here on YouTube, you can leave a comment, and you can go subscribe to the weekly emails to go behind the scenes and get extra info from each episode.